probably won't have time to play the whole thing, which is probably a big relief to you. Uh, what would you like to start with? Start um, with well, the first movement, um, it's really more of me working on it, spending a lot more time with it, but I really want to, I really want to work on my, I guess, fluidity and the way I move on the second movement. Sure. Okay. For me, that's the harder. Okay. Let's start with that. And here's the thing, I'm going to get out of your way, it's only a, like a minute and change. So I'm going right. to let you play through the whole movement, and then I'll uh, uh, share some thoughts after. start out from the beginning. Sometimes I work backwards, but today I, I'll, I'll actually work from the beginning and move forward. That's unusual for me. Um, I noticed that you're taking quite a bit of time at the entrance. Mm -hmm. I might take just a smidge less time because I think that it's great to use rubato in a movement like this. Uh, she didn't specifically indicate it, but obviously it's supposed to be, a chanson is supposed to be expressive. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when I'm playing something that's very lyrical like this, I like to establish the rhythm a little bit more before before making a big change in, in what's going on rhythmically. Um, and obviously a piece like this, it's a little easier to lock in rhythmically when you're playing with, uh, with an accompanist or playing mm -hmm. with orchestra. But... For me, I felt like you could establish the pulse just a little bit more in the early part of the piece, and that gives you a little bit more credibility and something for the audience to latch onto um, as they get into it. has something they can really relate to as far as pulse, and I think it makes it more effective. Once you establish something and then you change it, um, sometimes that makes for more effective rubato. Um, and when you talked about this movement, the first thing you said was talking about your connectivity and the mm. smoothness. What's the most important thing that a saxophone <coughs> can do to establish smoothness and contact connectivity in your playing? I mean, as far as the actual playing of the saxophone. What's the most important thing, in your opinion, um, that a saxophonist has to do to play really connected? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about like technical wise, like air wise, or like playing? Air. Wise? Well, I, mean, I would think air. Air. Would be the air. First thing sure. Comes to my mind. Right. Absolutely. And air is definitely playing wise. It's mm -hmm. it's it's the air. And to your credit, most of the time you do a really nice job of connecting your large interval slurs, and occasionally you don't. And that's where I hear. 
Now I'm exaggerating grossly. Generally it wasn't like that, but I'd get little breaks, uh, sometimes in the phrase that I was pretty sure you'd intend to do musically. Now obviously there are plenty of places here where we want to put a little bit of lift in between ideas, but in most of the time when you did lift, it, I could tell that it was on purpose. Mm -hmm. Occasionally that wasn't the case. Would you take it from the beginning for me? And we'll play right up to um, right up to rehearsal one. It'll give you a chance to really build. Even there, how much more connected can you make the C sharp to the B to the G sharp to the F? Because I dee -da, dee -da. It might even be that you're vibrating each note individually, and so I'm hearing it as four separate notes. Mm. Just do everything you can to blow through the line. And you might think about using your vibrato through the line as well. Maybe that will. C sharp yeah. and that, yeah, I agree. So uh, let's leave the vibrato out again and just focus entirely on the connectivity. And there I heard between the B and the G sharp. So let's let's take rhythm out of the equation too. Surprise yourself. Right now your brain is putting inserting little tiny breaks, probably out of habit. Um, how do you, how many of you practice? I, I have bad news. That, that means you're, you're reinforcing bad habits. Until you manage to catch all of the things that you're doing, all of the little tiny practice things that you're doing not quite right. Uh, the good news is if you're being really attentive, then you're doing a lot more uh, constructive things and reinforcing good habits. But as long as you continue to improve and practice over the course of your musical career, yeah, you're going to catch yourself. You're going to say, wow, I've been doing that for over years. And whatever, and uh, hopefully, as you continue to grow and play, you will catch those little things. But right now, I think your brain is kind of programmed in this passage. You probably play this a lot of times, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is trick your brain and allow you to do something else other than what you practice. So can we try this? I still heard it. Yeah. So... Now let's put in a crescendo. Well, just a little crescendo from the F sharp to the G sharp. I like that better. Yeah, it's kind of good. Right? So, so we, we nailed it once in a row. Let's do it again. Go ahead and go back to the real tempo. Yeah. Uh -huh. Go ahead and tell me specifically what you were talking about. Uh, so, well, because I, for the C sharp, um, I'll bring you down and make it a little darker, like just to work up the fifth line. You bring it down so mm -hmm. they didn't move. Quite fast, so I got like a little bit of a B flat in there. You got a little bit yeah. of a blip in there. Okay, that's what I thought you were talking about. Yeah. So let's uh, start at the same place. This time we'll continue, and I'll probably let you play all the way up to one. Um, where there's a little bit of a break and you're coming from a really closed fingering from the E 
to the C sharp. It's right in the middle of the uh, the seventh bar. <laughs> So you might want to look at um, at using some kind of resonance fingering that's a little bit more closed for going from the E to the C sharp there. The problem is the note after that is a B, so you can't use you can't use a really closed C sharp because then when you go to the B it's going to go rah, rah, rah. so you have to find kind of a happy medium. And there are a few different fingerings you can use there that um, that we could talk about, or but I'm. You're cheating that rhythm ever so slightly. And you didn't invent this because almost all of my students do the same thing when they play the piece. They play. just a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. It's easier to do again with an accompanist, but we want to make sure that the accompanist isn't being our metronome, so we're right. incredibly accurate with rhythm even when we don't have enough pianists with us, because sometimes they're wrong. Don't tell your accompanist that, but it's true. Let's go ahead and continue. I have a quick question about vibrato. How are you building those Bs? What are you, uh, the B and the C sharp, um, what are you doing with your vibrato to, to build those notes? And I don't know is a I perfectly fair answer, but no, I just keep it just the same. There's not really a change. There is, actually. You're playing a change. I am. You are. Let's go ahead and take it from the edge. So you're starting, or you didn't do it as much this time, but I was hearing... Exaggerating, you're not doing that, but that's kind of the effect I'm getting. Where you're starting with a slow vibrato and then building with the vibrato. Now, first of all, that's not a bad thing. I mean, hopefully, we shape with a vibrato and we're not like the vibrato machine where somebody presses a button and I go. And occasionally, when I hear criticism of Marcel Mules playing, they say, Oh, well, he's using a vibrato box and that's all he pops it out. I don't think that's necessarily a fair criticism, but on the flip side, most people when they play, they don't sound like Marcel Mule uh, with vibrato and you know a contemporary current saxophone playing. How many of you have listened to recordings of Marcel Mule? Okay, they have this really cool thing called what's with a face tube, you face, uh, uh, um, you, uh, help me out here. What's it called? YouTube. Yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah, uh, yeah, YouTube. You can find all kinds of great recordings of Marcel Mule. And uh, Sigurd Rascher and a lot of uh, the historical, uh, very important players on on YouTube, and it's uh, it's wonderfully free. Just find a place with internet access that you can. Well, actually, probably most of you guys can pull it up on your phone right now. Um, but uh, I want to I want to ask a question. Sure. Yes. W would you just talk for a minute about the difference between the French kind of playing that Marcel Mule or Defaye or one of those guys would do, and what is there an American style of legit vibrato and everything? Absolutely. Actually, um, uh, two of the most important figures in the 20th century for our instrument, particularly in, in classical playing, were Sigurd Rascher, and that's S-I-G-U-R-D, R-A-S-C-H-E-R. And uh, people frequently refer to his kind of school of thought of playing as the Rascher school. It's sometimes described as the German school because it's Germanic, but he was in Sweden and this and that. We'll call it the Rascher school for now, just for ease. But a lot of people refer to that as German school playing. And then Marcel Mule, uh, M-A-R-C-E-L, and Mule, just like, uh, yeah, Mule. I've heard some people pronounce it Mule, but apparently he pronounced it Mule, so I, I, I believe him. Um, for starters, uh, Altissimo and the use of Altissimo uh, really comes from the Rascher school. He was a big proponent of Altissimo, and uh, when uh, the Glazunov or the uh, the Eber Concertina de Camera were written, 